everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Connie Rutledge. I'm the CEO of Finnovation Lab. Um, and we uh, worked with Matthew Messerly uh, this summer. He is a student at the University of Minnesota Law School, reached out to us about wanting to do a project. And I said, what do you know about crowdfunding? Because we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs really gravitate towards uh, this mechanism for fundraising, and we wanted to invest it investigate it a little bit more and develop a guide for founders. So um, to, as you think about like, is crowdfunding right for you? We're assuming that is one reason you are in this session today. And we're going to get into each of these, but it really depends on who your audience is and how much you can leverage that for a campaign, what the purpose of your company is, as well as the purpose of the campaign and how you can attract people, and then which platform is the right fit. Um, and I have got both Matthew, the law student, and Jeremy Kalen from Advise and Legal, and they both want me to point out not legal advice being offered here today, and that you should speak with a lawyer as you delve into crowdfunding. So every entrepreneur has to deal with the issue of where is the money going to come from to grow my business? Um, and you know, many founders will tap their personal savings and then they move on to friends and family. But what do you do if that's just not available to you? Where do you start? Um, people talk a lot about angel investors and venture capital as well. And not only can those investors be a challenge to find, you can have an even harder time finding a really good fit with you and your business. They rarely fund getting to a prototype or a minimum viable product, except for some of the more technologically uh, challenging ideas that have some strong IP protection in place. So not every business is a great fit with the return profile or the criteria of those types of investors. So it's uh, and then loans or PRIs, program related investments, which some of our impact founders may be uh, familiar with, um, that you need, you need to have confidence you can borrow the money and repay it, number one, as the founder. And then it can be challenging to secure those if you don't have any assets or even a revenue record. So, you know, it's no wonder that founders have decided to turn to crowdfunding because it feels like you've got a lot of people who are ready to back your idea. How can we mobilize them? And the number one thing we want you to remember today is that crowdfunding is not easier uh, than these other options. It's just different. And we want to share with you some information and some ideas so that you can set your expectations uh, in a realistic way and you can start to build a strategy to make a successful campaign. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Matthew. Um, so hey everybody, uh, just to get started here, uh, we have some numbers for crowdfunding in 2020. Um, as of 2020, it was crowdfunding was a $17 billion industry with a 33% year-on-year growth. The average amount raised by crowdfunding campaigns was $22,000. This is all just to say that it's a very large, sorry. I'm sorry, I've been told you cannot see the slide changes. Um, hmm. <laughs> it looks like you can on, on hop in. Technical fun. Um, Hold on one sec, everybody. Because on my screen, I can see it. Huh. We're working on it. Thanks for patience, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing and start again. All right. Okay, sweet. <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, this is all just to say that. Uh, sorry about the interruption. Um, but this is all just to say that crowdfunding is a very large and growing industry, um, and we only expect it to get larger from here. Um, throughout the presentation, we're going to talk about three main types of uh, crowdfunding campaigns. These are focusing on uh, donation based campaigns, reward-based campaigns, and equity. 
Um, donation is your standard, you know, uh, charitable giving sort of social good cause um, sort of campaigns. Rewards-based campaigns are more a deliverable product uh, sort of focus. And equity crowdfunding is a very new development in the field, and we'll get into that uh, later. So just to start with donation-based crowdfunding uh, platforms, these, as I mentioned, don't generally have an expectation of a return for contributions, um, and they're generally linked to a targeted social cause. Um, examples of platforms that support this are GoFundMe and JustGiving. Um, a helpful example is uh, of a donation-based crowdfunding campaign could be something like uh, raising money in your community to support uh, local lemonade stands. Um, getting into some best practices for donation-based crowdfunding, um, communication is going to be important for all of them. Here, uh, you're going to want to clearly articulate why you're raising funds, how those funds are going to be used, and how those funds will further the cause you're trying to support. Um, again, uh, keep messaging consistent throughout your campaign, and make sure that you follow through on your promises. Um, as mentioned, this is a cause-related sort of tool, so contributing to the cause for many uh, of your supporters will be its own reward, but offering them recognition uh, and things like that might uh, really resonate with your crowd, depending on the campaign. Be sure to develop clear links between uh, the supporters you have, the crowd you have, the goals you're trying to achieve, and then the compelling social cause that you're trying to support. Um, making sure that that narrative is crystallized uh, will go a long way towards achieving success. And on that note, uh, Jeremy is going to talk about an example of donation-based crowdfunding. So uh, good day, I guess, midday, uh, uh, morning, technically. Uh, I'm Jeremy Kalen. I'm an attorney at Avizen Legal. We're a boutique business law firm here in town, about three blocks away. And uh, I help co-lead the Impact Council practice focused on working with change makers focused on deep sustainability and social ventures. Uh, one of the two and my work actually happens to be at the intersection. Uh, I was lucky enough to engage with Dion Sims um, about 16 months, 15 months ago, uh, the founder of Black Garnet Books when she put out in the world uh, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, um, the fact that Minnesota did not have any black owned bookstores and she had had this vision, it was time to make it a reality. So I've been lucky to uh, be her uh, legal counsel and advisor in launching Black Garnet Books, um, not only doing the legal side, but uh, thinking together around the best means to raise the startup revenue to launch the bookstore. Um, most people, when we talk about crowdfunding, focus on the word funding, and uh, we're gonna really emphasize over and over and over the role of a campaign and then building the crowd. Um, Dion brought to uh, Black Garner Books launch um, already a compelling social media audience. We actually connected via Twitter, um, but she went from zero followers to 16,000 followers on Instagram for Black Garner Books uh, within, I think it's less than a week. And so as we looked at what's the best way between donation rewards and equity, for her to raise funds for startup uh, of the bookstore, we realized that time was of the essence. It was the perfect timing in the wake of George Floyd um, and, uh, and the mobilization to do something about systemic racism and to support black and brown entrepreneurs um, that in the end we chose, uh, she chose to proceed with the donation model. So using uh, her GoFundMe campaign and it was phenomenal to see the success. We, Turned out we were right um, in going through that pathway to say, hey, let's start with a $72,000 goal. We, I think she exceeded that in 48 hours. We ended up almost doubling it um, uh, in the end. I think she raised 118,000, 120,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. We deliberately did not choose the rewards pathway because we realized that um, just fulfilling orders, that largely what she was doing was wanting people just to invest in the mission as a donation and just support it and get it to rock and roll and no expectation coming back. I think lastly, we'll just say, and so that was the logistical planning uh, note there. Um, 
I'll just lastly say that she had a W-2 sort of paid employee, you know, corporate gig before that she's been very forthright about. And one of the things that uh, all entrepreneurs need to think about is making sure you have health insurance <laughs> from the get-go as you make this jump. And, uh, and so um, just want to continue to harp that home if you're ready to launch and ready to rock and roll. Um, one of the great things about the Affordable Care Act and uh, Minsure is that you can actually get health insurance in a timely basis now so that you don't end up having your entrepreneurial vision undercut by health crisis and other uh, other um, budget issues on that end. So that's Black Burner Books. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is reward-based platforms. So these are generally directly financing a good or a service. Um, these are best for when an offering is our, the offering of your company is already readily marketable, marketable and distributable, um, and where you can tangibly link your goals uh, and your rewards that supporters will receive to the actual uh, return. Classic examples are Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and iPhone Women. Um, Stick with a lemonade example. Uh, an example of this would be to run a Kickstarter for funding to distribute really cool lemonade mugs. Um, some best practices for rewards-based crowdfunding. Um, a huge part of rewards-based crowdfunding is, funny enough, choosing the rewards you're going to offer people um, for contributing to your campaign. So our advice here is to uh, get creative, but stay on character. Um, Recognition-based rewards are a low-cost option that can really resonate with certain crowds. And um, having something in store for big and small contributors can go a long way to uh, diversifying the number of people and expanding the crowd that you're able to attract. Um, and again, going back to the first point, link rewards to your campaign as well as your company. Uh, develop that clear narrative throughout your communications, uh, and that will go a long way towards success. As far as communications, um, you know, avoid fraud, uh, manage expectations, but also clearly articulate your deliverable and your timeline as well as any other relevant information that might help people uh, get on board. I knew there was a crowdfunding campaign uh, that Connie and I spoke about um, that provided the tracking information for a book shipment as it sailed across the Pacific. Um, anything that can really help your crowd really get invested in the story of your campaign. Um, with that, I think Jeremy's gonna talk about another example of rewards-based crowdfunding. So uh, if you listen to some of the same podcasts that I listen to, or uh, even uh, um, a video game I was playing on my phone last night, uh, Brooklyn uh, it appears to be in so many places, at least uh, maybe I'm their target audience. Um, uh, you know, direct to consumer luxury sheets. Uh, the, um, if you ever wanna hear the uh, founders tell their story, Guy Raz uh, from NPR uh, has a great podcast um, how I built this and the founders of Brooklyn and uh, were on and told the story uh, pretty deeply about their Kickstarter and the challenges that they um, that they had to overcome uh, specifically on the logistics side. Pretty successful, I think of Kickstarter and I use that as the, the stand-in for all rewards as a pre-sale, right? You're selling your product uh, at a little bit of a discount um, to those early backers, but you're promising to deliver something. So the notion of don't commit fraud <laughs> is tell the truth and do your uh, do everything you can to deliver. So they uh, started with a goal of 50,000, obviously with uh, um, nearly 2000 backers and a quarter million dollars, almost they blew almost five decks of that goal, which is phenomenal. And the rewards are everything from a tote bag to this um, private tour partner treatment, but the bulk of their, and you can just Google Brooklyn and Kickstarter and see their campaign. The, uh, bulk of their sales of their rewards levels were the hundred to two hundred fifty dollar sheet sets, so they were really pre-selling sheets. Well, just like that book coming across the Pacific, Brooklyn and his team came into a boatload, literally, of logistical challenges in getting from their manufacturers in China, uh, actually getting impounded at the port. I think it was the port of Long Beach and not being able to get their products released. So they ended up doing a, four, a total of 14 different updates for backers just on their Kickstarter site. And I know that they gave, did more emails as well. And what they did was say, hey, we're on this journey together. Here's what we're learning. 
we love our products. We're stuck in impound. Here's what we're learning about customs. And uh, I can't remember if it was specifically for Brooklyn or, or other projects in which I've been involved where some of those early backers actually step forward and say, hey, I know somebody at that customs office, I think, or did you, did you make this declaration rather than that? Um, and so you really get this chance of a campaign, but you get backers who are truly emotionally invested in addition to just financially invested. Um, so yeah, so getting into the third of the three platforms, equity-based crowdfunding is a relatively new development in the field. Um, this uh, form of crowdfunding is generally best towards uh, funding specific business objectives, and it can often raise larger amounts of, uh, and have larger funding targets than the other platforms, in part because of its structure. Supporters here will receive a stake in your company, um, which cr will create obligations for founders, both in terms of your required communications for, uh, under the regula regulations that are around, as well as expectations for those investors on what they can expect in returns. Um, the platform example we hear uh, we have here is WeFunder. Um, the lemonade example would be uh, raising money uh, and selling shares in a lemonade business to fund a food truck to distribute that lemonade. Um, so. Before I continue, I'm going to make a quick detour through the wonderful world of securities regulation. Um, so uh, there's a long history of funding in the United States for uh, crowdfunding and community-based funding, um, but it wasn't until the 2012 Jobs Act uh, that the Securities and Exchange Commission was really tasked with supporting equity-based crowdfunding as a tool for businesses. And before that, we had donation rewards crowdfunding, and some states had their own um, with like own crowdfunding regulations within their states, but it wasn't until regulation crowdfunding from the SEC and then particularly the most recent March update that we really got the support for equity-based crowdfunding. This is all to say it's relatively new development, um, which is quite exciting. Um, unfortunately, this also means that equity crowdfunding is the most complex of the options that's going to be available to you. Um, there are going to be restrictions on the, on the actions you can take as a company, uh, what your funding targets can be, as well as who can invest and how much they can invest. One thing that trips people up sometimes is the difference between accredited and unaccredited investor. Accredited investors are going to be um, those with access to more capital, or generally people uh, who are um, uh, with higher uh, contribution uh, contributions available to invest, um, whereas unaccredited investors are the rest of us. Um, everybody else who the SEC basically doesn't want to uh, be betting the farm, whereas a credit investor, the SEC is, is more comfortable saying that they can handle the loss. Um, to protect investors, the SEC has built a comprehensive regulatory framework. Um, most of that framework is going to be just requiring certain disclosures about your company and about how you're going to use funds. Um, the major goal of these regulations is ensuring that the people who are contributing to your campaign know what they're getting into and know what risks they're signing up for. Um, for founders, we would uh, again stress this will require preparation and we highly recommend getting legal counsel, um, particularly someone experienced in the field. So getting back uh, to best practices for equity crowdfunding, I'm going to reiterate uh, hiring a specialized lawyer in particular will go a long way to making sure that you're ready for this crowdfunding option and that you're uh, on your way to success. Um, the other thing, we talked about the goals of the regulations, presenting a clear and com an ac or a complete and accurate description of your business and your funding objectives is going to basically be the heart of what you're required to do for these campaigns. Um, that'll include documentation such as your fin company's financial records, preferably audited, uh, your corporate organizational documents, as well as how you plan to allocate the funds that you raise and your justification for why those funds are needed for the goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, communication was a best practice for donation and rewards-based crowdfunding. Here it's going to be a mandatory practice. Um, so you're going to want to de develop a detailed communications plan that discusses how your company is going to plan to talk to regulators and contributors. You're going to want to know exactly how funds will be used and how you're prepared to utilize those funds responsibly and effectively. Um, again, and also, and this goes for the other ones as well, um, make sure that you stay in touch regularly with your contributors, both during the campaign as well as after. 
for equity crowdfunding, those are going to be people who are quite literally invested in the success of your business. So keeping them up to date is going to be very important. And with that, we have a couple examples for equity-based crowdfunding. Um, all right, so Net Zero is a local company here. Uh, they are a member of Finnovation Lab, and Sue Marshall is the founder. And it's very exciting. Net Zero is launching an equity crowdfunding campaign as we speak. They're in pre launch phase right now on WeFunder that should go public next week. So I encourage everyone to keep an eye out on that and maybe dig in a little bit, and you can better understand kind of what an equity crowdfunding campaign looks like. So for those of you not familiar with Net Zero, uh, they are a leader in industrial food waste upcycling. Um, and their growth potential is really rooted in their technology and the scalability of that tech and the protections they have in intellectual property. So they're trying to raise a million dollars to scale the business. Um, and you know, they really, uh, in my conversations with the founder, the conversation has been around how do we take our community of supporters and give them an opportunity to really invest in the company when they are not in that accredited investor status. So people who care about the sustainability messaging and the backing a woman-owned business, those kinds of things, they're able to bring them in through an equity crowdfunding campaign. So as, Jer or as uh, Matthew mentioned, like both accredited and unaccredited investors can be involved in equity campaigns but how much they can invest is regulated by the SEC. So the other great thing with the example of net zero that I learned is how much documentation they have put in to their campaign plan. So there was a nearly 30 page plan for the campaign and that spawned additional documents all around the communications. Who's the audience? What is the message that we're doing? Um, so, you know, it's very well thought out, very articulated, and I'm excited to see how the actual campaign goes. So follow along and maybe uh, once Net Zero is through their campaign, we'll do a follow up here at FinLab on how it went. But we have one other example that's a slightly different approach to equity crowdfunding. So I've been fortunate to be legal counsel to uh, Ralph Jacobson and a number of uh, solar projects for um, underserved or untapped markets. One of the most challenging uh, spaces and market segments to secure financing uh, historically has been for uh, indigenous communities and, and native tribes. Uh, Ralph's been working with Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota for a decade or longer on exploring uh, solar potential. And one of uh, half of the economics of solar projects come from uh, taking advantage of federal and state uh, tax benefits, including the investment tax credit. But the challenge has always been getting a loan for the other half. One of the principles around sovereignty and self-governance, not only for tribal economic development broadly, but specifically for energy development, has been uh, an innovation that, uh, uh, that Ralph really put forward where the solar contract has been subject not to Minnesota law and Minnesota courts, but to tribal law. Well, that can be a real challenge for conventional lenders. Uh, imagine Wells Fargo Bank uh, feeling comfortable that that's their recourse and where they have to go. So uh, uh, we worked with Ralph, uh, advising legal, my colleague Brian worked with Ralph to um, structure an equity-like offering through the state-based platform that Matthew uh, referenced called MinVest, that really has been, um, that compliance regime has really been uh, subsumed within the federal regulation crowdfunding platform now because of the update to the rules. So our next loan is going to be, uh, crowdfunded loan offering is going to be uh, likely offered through Regulation CF next spring or next winter. Uh, but what uh, Ralph was able to do was to get, I think it was 32 individual investors who um, participated in this loan pool, uh, a five-year loan at two and a half percent. So why is this in the equity side? Well, because it's a loan of this type is considered a security from the um, Securities Exchange Commission perspective and the Securities Act. So uh, traditionally, we would not be able to advertise before MinVest or Regulation CF to non-accredited investors and say, hey, you're interested in risking your money to support this project. Crowdfunding allows us to do that. 
So it's not just taking shares in a uh, company, but can be being an investor in a loan pool or uh, project finance as well. I'm really excited about what we can do here um, using the Regulation CF platform now. Um, so uh, thinking about your campaign, let's say you've decided you want to uh, do a crowdfunding campaign. Um, we have a couple helpful little pointers for uh, things to think about as you get into that process. Um, first off, you're going to want to craft the story of your business and campaign. This is the politely concise version of, uh, of how you'd answer some, a friend asking you, what does your business do? It's the narrative of how your company as well as your campaign uh, all flow together. As far as objectives, this is what specifically the funding is going to help you achieve, um, both in terms of uh, as a company as well as what the campaign's goals are. Um, tying into that, uh, what are you going to offer contributors to your campaign? Thinking about uh, recognition-based rewards as well as other tangible rewards, or in the case of equity crowdfunding, exploring those different options for what you can offer as a security. Um, who's going to be attracted to those offerings and why? And being very deliberate about uh, how you present those offerings to your potential audience is going to be a very important strategic consideration to make before you get uh, too deep into the campaign, um, and it's a great uh, foundational work to get done uh, in advance. Um, additionally, for communications, you're going to want to make sure that you're uh, comfortable with disclosing certain things, particularly for um, equity-based crowdfunding. You're going to want to make sure that you're prepared to disclose, because equity crowdfunding will require a lot of information about your company's finances, company's organizational structure, um, additionally, be prepared to communicate with your crowd regardless of uh, which platform you choose. In terms of logistics, think about your platforms. Even within uh, like rewards, for example, each of the different crowdfunding platforms will offer uh, different solutions to rewards-based crowdfunding. They have different communities, different cultures, and different expectations. Um, additionally, think about advisors, what the timing, timeline is going to look like for your project how you're planning to market things deliberately to your crowd, as well as what your backup plan is and what your, um, your strategy will be post-campaign. Um, real quick, we do have a helpful checklist here for what platform is right uh, might be right for you. Um, the broad strokes are, again, just to synthesize, synthesize things, equity crowdfunding is a very powerful tool that comes with its own challenges. Um, Donation-based crowdfunding focuses more on social causes and community benefits, and rewards-based crowdfunding is generally tailored to uh, tangible products or deliverable services of that sort. For each of these, though, again, we want to stress, as Jeremy mentioned early on, um, the crowd is key. So getting into that, how do you build a crowd? Um, we, one of the people we spoke with uh, said it was like running for office, having events, networking, uh, Focus groups, targeted marketing are all going to be very key to making sure that you develop a crowd in advance of launch. Um, and the reason you want to do that is because you're going, uh, we highly recommend securing at least 30% of your funding goal before you even launch. Getting people signed up for mailing lists, getting people to pledge to commit to your campaign is going to go a long way to your eventual success. It's at least a year's worth of work as well, so be sure to start early and give yourself plenty of time to work on the campaign. Um, getting into how do we leverage that crowd. Um, communication, again, is key. Uh, email, actually, is what we found is one of the most powerful tools for uh, driving support and contributions, with half of all email shares resulting in an eventual contribution to your campaign. Um, get creative and make your supporters feel special um, make them feel part of the story. That's going to be key to getting them emotionally invested um, as well as hopefully financially invested in your success. Before you, before you launch, um, know that successful campaigns demand a lot of time, effort, and preparation. You're going to want to set out a plan. Um, you're going to want to focus on what your purpose is for the campaign, your audience will be, how you're going to target them, and what platforms you're going to use to do that. Um, also, be sure to get help. Uh, marketing professional will go a long way towards your campaign success, as will hiring a lawyer. Um, 
And there's other things to think about regarding logistics and finance. Um, for all the crowdfunding, but particularly equity, think about getting your financial documents ready, getting yourself organized as an entity, um, making sure that all of that is complete and as accurate as possible. Um, for equity, that's going to be mandatory, and a lawyer will help with that. Um, so just a couple caveats before we close. Know that most successful crowdfunding campaigns raise around $30,000. Um, there are wild success stories of you know, uh, campaigns that blow past their targets, but shooting for around 30000 is going to be a really a, a good, reasonable starting point. Um, additionally, campaigns that raise 30% of their total, we mentioned this earlier, um, are far more likely to succeed. So making sure that you have that locked in before you even launch is going to go uh, is going to be very important towards your eventual success. We mentioned having uh, reward options for both uh, small and large contributors, and that's partially because the average pledge is around 80 to 100 dollars. Um, this can be this can vary greatly with uh, different campaigns, but particularly. Um, it's important to have options. You know, I, we talked about the lemonade mugs for Kickstarter. You know, I would want to have sticker sheets for the smaller contrib uh, contributors and have larger options such as larger orders for greater contributors, just to make sure I'm capturing as much of my crowd as possible. Um, and lastly, somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of crowdfunding campaigns succeed. This goes to show it's a very large field, um, and it's challenging, but all of this is intended to tell you, like, help you cut through the noise and make sure that you're achieving success and you're set up for success. Be sure that you're prepared in advance to be part of that 20 to 30. So just to wrap up with some closing thoughts, um, be ready to commit. This is a field that rewards driven, invested, and diligent leaders. Um, give yourself plenty of time to execute on your plan and your campaign. 12 to 18 months is the target that we've been seeing uh, works for successful campaigns. And key to all of this, um, strategically build personal connections. Uh, get individuals to buy in and emotionally connect with your work. Um, reaching a funding goal is great, but the huge benefit of all this work for crowdfunding campaigns is to actually develop your audience in advance of um, whatever business you plan on um, continuing post-campaign. Um, these are going to be people who will be able to contribute perspectives throughout your campaign, uh, be able to word of mouth share your positive reputation that you build with them. And um, these are going to be people who are going to be future customers, if not brand ambassadors. Connecting with people is huge and the biggest benefit, I would say, of a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and then it's not up there, but I'll stress again, get a lawyer. It goes a long way. Um, with that, I think Connie will close. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. As you can see, uh, it's been super fun working with Matthew over the course of the summer. And your land grant university is doing a great job. Future <laughs> lawyers. Uh, so at the top here, you'll see a URL. We do have a downloadable crowdfunding guide that kind of summarizes everything we've talked about today as well as outline some of the questions you need to be asking yourself as you start to plan whether or not you are going to do a crowdfunding campaign for your business. So I am going to um, stop, slide, stop the slideshow and stop sharing. And I don't know that that's going to bring our camera back, but it's our best bet. Um, Uh-oh. Pull that out together. My screen has gone entirely blank, everyone. So, uh, but Katrina is online and I'm hoping that uh, if we have questions, you wanna pose them in the chat. Here it comes back, very good, all right. Thank you, Katrina, for posting that URL. Are there any questions? We have one participant here in person. If you have any questions, feel free to chime in as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about a crowdfunding source of dollars and working with private investors' money and how that works together? Sure. Who wants to tackle that? Jeremy, maybe? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think it's a 
question? Yeah, so the question is, um, how might crowdfunding dollars and investor dollars, like someone who's a more traditional investor, how do those work together? Um, and, you know, are you curious if private investors are open to crowdfunding? Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's uh, two issues. One is legal compliance, right? Can we do this? And the second then is if we can, what's the impression or how do the um, how are more institutional or private investors, how do they view a crowdfunding campaign? So um, at a big picture, we're always careful about what the, in the securities law is called integration. What I call the ghostbusters, don't, don't cross the streams, right? <laughs> don't uh, make the two wires touch that can make it so that you're accidentally offering advertising to the world. Um, so soliciting for investment and making an offering that doesn't allow you to do that. So this is where talking to a lawyer and saying, let's make sure that you're not right now raising money from, um, uh, from individual or, or sorry, from institutional investors. Doing that, uh, raising money from, um, from institutional investors and private investors through an offering and then launching a crowdfunding campaign. If you're doing that just so you can get around this, the advertising solicitation, the SEC is gonna say that's a no-no. So talk to an attorney, but it is totally doable to just do a crowdfunding campaign and have both accredited and unaccredited investors, meaning people on the street and a family office or a foundation or a you know, a very sophisticated, even a venture capital or angel investment uh, network might do so. How do they view it? Well, what we do is is follow the uh, guidelines that Matthew summarized, which is I treat a disclosure packet as if we're disclosing every risk to the most sophisticated investor while using plain language. So it's understandable to the small investor that you're trying to reach your crowdfunding. So you can do it. I see very, very little hesitation unless someone is truly a venture capital fund and they want different uh, treatment in terms of stock, uh, preferred stock or something else that you're not offering. But um, I like to think about if you don't have investors teed up, but you have momentum, a crowdfunding campaign can be a campaign to also raise your visibility. So you can tell your story to a broader audience. You have to look at what's the time frame you have to wait to then do a new round of fundraising, but we can absolutely work that. It's a great question. Um, so yeah, I guess I can chime in for the question that's in the chat as far as a recommendation around small offline crowdfunding. I think key there is uh, small and because uh, on, on that respect, um, again, going back to most of the regulatory regime here is going to be focused on equity based crowdfunding because that's all linked in with securities and the SEC cares a lot about securities. Um, as far as donation and rewards based crowdfunding, uh, the only yeah. real regulatory and enforcement mechanisms linked to that are going to be not to commit fraud as a business. So if you're raising money for a cause, through a car wash or a bake sale, make sure that you're not committing fraud by not actually focusing on that goal. Um, make sure that your, your communications are accurate to what you're actually trying to accomplish. So that would be the only real thought I would have on that. I guess, Jeremy, if you want to speak more to like the advice side of it. Yeah, I think the, Matthew, the, um, uh, I'm always uh, concerned about whether, what regulation crowdfunding and sort of claiming um, that you're working under that securities exemption allows you to do is to advertise. And so um, we often see, and I didn't know this when I uh, wasn't practicing law, um, but was running my own company and talking to a securities lawyer is often that caution, like be reading a story and say, oh yeah, five years ago, the newspaper story. Yeah, they're trying to raise three and a half million dollars. Including that even in a news story can actually be a violation of the, uh, of the ban on advertising and solic public solicitation. So the private meetings, the one-on-one -on -one meetings from people that you know or get introduced to, those are kosher, those are totally okay with most offerings. But if you're not actually using the crowd regulation crowdfunding or MinVest platforms 
and you're advertising, you are at risk of, and you're asking people to put money at risk through an investment in a company um, or in that loan pool, for instance, um, you can you know, accidentally trip yourself up and get yourself into lots of trouble. That's why even in a half hour or 45 minute chat with a lawyer who knows what we're doing can help sort of keep things uh, clear and easy. The chances are you're not gonna get um, tagged uh, for you know, the equivalent of a base sale, but at the same time, um, see all the time people who accidentally make mistakes and you just wanna help. We can always unwind that quickly or uh, um, at least you know, minimize the number of years you're gonna spend in jail. Um, yeah, I guess I can I can speak a little bit to Patreon. My understanding of how Patreon works is, um, yeah, sorry. Um, my understanding of how Patreon works is it is an option. Um, it would more fall into the uh, earlier two categories of rewards and donation-based crowdfunding, um, in that your main uh, enforcement mechanism is going to be fraud and not committing fraud. Um, if for some reason you try to sell like shares in a business over Patreon, that's going to start to run into the problems okay. that Jeremy was talking about. Do not do that. Yes, no. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the, if I can also chime in, Matthew, I think you're spot on. And the Patreon, um, I think a Patreon is much more like uh, a rewards-based model and that you're saying you're gonna get a certain level of access or some sort of delivery, although, um, you're not, I've not actually seen a Patreon that's delivering an actual creative product other than, um, uh, so it's in many ways you're giving a donation with in exchange for some access to a preferred email list or a private conversation once a month um, with a creator. Um, and so, you know, again, of all of these, you also need to very carefully read the terms of use for that platform. Uh, because we haven't talked about it, but for instance, I believe it's Kickstarter and there are a couple of other platforms that uh, if you don't reach your funding target, you won't have access to those funds to being dispersed. That's a really creed provision in, a, in, in their terms of use. So the same with Patreon, you'd wanna uh, absolutely be sure to read very carefully and very clearly, but I'm not worried about the, the equity side. Um, what from a, broad legal trends perspective, what's not yet clear, because we're still very early in this March 2021 um, final adoption of the Regulation CF rules, what's the Federal Trade Commission going to be doing around fraud? How aggressive are they going to be on, for instance, the Kickstarter and the GoFundMe models, where the SEC doesn't have any um, uh, enforcement mechanism, but the Federal Trade Commission will be the one and, and state attorneys general on anti-fraud practices. Just tell the truth, <laughs> do your best, tell the truth. If something doesn't work, explain why, show your best efforts to try to resolve delivery of Kickstarter rewards or whatever. Um, but I would imagine that we'll see some pretty aggressive enforcement mechanisms because people do all sorts of stupid things that are not truthful <laughs> and uh, see the funding side, not the crowd when you talk about crowdfunding and you know, greed is everywhere, sadly. Yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll riff on that answer just a little bit. Um, in terms of uh, that, that greed, also, again, we talked about building a successful campaign. Um, part of the thought behind a lot of your communications is also going to be making sure that you're developing that reputation. Um, I know there are communities on Kickstarter as well as other plat crowdfunding platforms that if they have a negative experience because they've been lied to by a campaign, they'll go out of their way to make sure everybody knows that moving forward so they don't fall into the same mistakes. So again, compliance with the law, tell the truth. Um, I will say for terms and conditions, um, that also is informative for what platform might be right for you, because um, there are a lot of uh, particularly rewards-based crowdfunding platforms uh, that are all or nothing, and that can really change how your contributors will view the campaign. Um, whereas others, I, I know there's a campaign on iPhone women it can be more staggered and you know earn as you go, um, and that can really change the culture and the community that you're working with as you go. So keep that in mind as well. And then I, uh, one other sort of esoteric, I, I try not to practice law from the perspective of magic words. <laughs> right, lawyers. <laughs> um, on, uh, so if you think about like the um, Black Garnet Books decision to go with uh, GoFundMe campaign because 
uh, there's the least amount of friction there, right? There's not even any rewards to fulfill, and you're certainly giving away nothing from your company. You're just saying, hey, support me because it's a really good social cause. Even if we're a for-profit venture, we're a social venture, let's make it happen. Um, and so that was phenomenal to see, but the question became, how are those, uh, how is that income treated? And will it create uh, tax challenges at, for Black Runner Books? Is it sales income or is it a gift? And of course, GoFundMe says, we don't do anything. We're not gonna help you out here. But the, it's very clear that if you want to avoid it being treated as income and have it be truly recognized as a gift, as a donation, that you have to be very clear throughout your communication to your supporters that they are giving a donation with no expectation of anything in return. And so, you know, again, saying that proactively or um, throughout that communication process, even if a campaign is closed, to be very, very clear that you've used those magic words and uh, that term that can at least create the presumption that you have received them as a gift and make it harder to end up taxing it and creating more challenges. So again, a chat with a lawyer helps to identify a lot of these little little uh, speed bumps. Yeah, uh, again, stressing, get a lawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, that can go a long way. Uh, Rachel brings up a good point. There are also fees to be thinking about for these various Excellent. platforms. Um, so looking at what is going to be right for you I was going to, there's a lot to take into consideration, even once you've made a decision of what type of crowdfunding you're going to use, which platform you want to make adva take advantage of is going to also um, potentially change for your business. Um, and a lawyer will help with that, <laughs> that question. Um, I don't know if there are more questions in chat yet, but. Uh, no, but I have one. Hi, everybody. I'm actually here in the background. This is such a weird setup here. Uh, but I'm curious if either of you um, or anyone in the chat, for that matter, I see that, you know, Cedric is with Silicon Prairie. And like, are you seeing any opportunities for businesses that maybe haven't had access to traditional capital succeeding uh, in the crowdfunding realm? and feeling, you know, especially in equity crowdfunding, I'm really interested in that as kind of a new uh, platform, particularly for impact-driven businesses. And I'm just curious if you've come across anything where someone had tried to raise capital, was unsuccessful, but could do it in crowdfunding. I mean, the, the first thought that comes to mind, Connie, is actually the in the solar space of the loan side, which is not, uh, taking shares in the company, but we're sitting in a, in a loan pool um, where it's been hard to raise that fifty to five hundred thousand dollars of of funds, um, and uh, I'm seeing that uh, happen not just in Minnesota but but elsewhere. And um, the crowdfunding, the Regulation CF rules have made it possible to just rock and roll and, and do that without um, accidentally getting into into some trouble. I think the um, you know, certainly we've seen, I think, on a lot of hospitality, so breweries like crazy <laughs> have been using, uh, um, uh, in some cases, a sort of Kickstarter model where you get the free beer for, no, it's not free, but you get a, a lifetime supply of beer if you uh, are an early backer, um, and they're not getting a share of the company. Some are actually giving away share, you know, or selling, I should say. Um, uh, shares or percentage of the company. But I think part of what I'm interested in is um, one of the challenges had been in, uh, before the regulation CF rules is that you needed to have everyone was an investor on what's called your cap table on your company as a shareholder. And so if I, you know, give a hundred dollars as a minimum and I'm getting one share, well, you have to communicate with me. I have minority rights as a shareholder. And if you have, 500 backers that are tiny, you got to talk to all of us, otherwise you're violating our rights as shareholders. Now what you can do is actually create a, what's called a special purpose vehicle or special purpose entity under the new rules. And so all those investors become just one shareholder. You have a lead representative that you have to communicate with, and then they're responsible to communicate with all the other backers. That I think is going to uh, help them open up the floodgates to your question, but I'm curious if others have seen. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, Cedric is saying that they've definitely uh, seen some deals getting done and reiterating that the crowd is the key thing. And from a Finnovation Lab perspective, you know, I mean, we're here to sort of create support and resources for entrepreneurs in particular, social impact ones. And so stay tuned, I think, is my message to everyone who's interested in this, because I, I'm going to follow it. Right, and I think that we can develop some uh, some resources that can help people put their campaigns together. And so, if you're curious and interested about that kind of thing, um, I'll put in a plug for our newsletter. Sign up so that we can keep in touch with you, um, or you can always reach out to me directly. It's just Connie at fin-lab.com, and I'm happy to keep the conversation going. Um, and then Rachel is sharing another example here about the Drivers Cooperative. Um, and a co-op is an interesting model too. Uh, I'd be curious to hear more about that, Rachel. We may have to connect offline about what you are working on. Sounds interesting. All right, I think we have technically seven minutes, but I know uh, Twin Cities Startup Week can be a little hectic going from one thing to the next. If there's any last questions, we are happy to take it. I'll make one observation uh, at a summary level, Connie, while you're also participating in the chat. So this is a fun live, we're making up as we go here. Um, uh, I really think about, as uh, um, Matthew's great overview uh, laid out, is thinking about needing three elements for a successful crowdfunding campaign. You have to ensure that you're complying. So the legal compliance, um, you know, don't make those mistakes that I was talking about. So kind of legal, the Second is you need a platform of some sort to take those donations. So that's why we keep on talking about Kickstarter, refund, um, uh, iFund Women, GoFundMe, et cetera, WeFunder, excuse me, um, that you need a platform uh, that just makes it easy to do all the disclosures that you need to do in order to comply and to take people's money um, uh, pretty easily. Then the third is you need to build the crowd. You need the campaign. So I think about it as compliance, a platform, and the crowd itself um, and without and you need all three this is not like you can choose <laughs> don't <laughs> um, you need all three and you need to work at it it does take work yes don't leave home without knowing that message right <laughs> like this is not a throwaway don't put your campaign side up and hope for the best all right, we have one more question here. I'm curious at how you can obtain targeted emails to communicate with potential users uh, for a product and development. Any thoughts on that? Um, I, I can go, yeah, go for it. But, um, I know that a lot of campaigns uh, will basically put out like initial feelers for especially, particularly reward and donation-based crowdfunding. Um, here it sounds like more of a reward-based crowdfunding sort of approach. Um, you put out feelers, get interest, and then get people to sign up for a mailing list. And then um, when the time comes, you can make, take advantage of that mailing list to get people to uh, buy into your campaign. And Jeremy has more to say on that. Yeah, so the, um, uh, to get very granular, so Matthew uh, referenced at least one person uh, that uh, he talked to that said, you know, it's like running for office. Um, well, I did actually run for office three times for the state legislature, actually won twice. Um, and part of that same fundraising uh, strategy that I'll just share with you really quickly that I share with FinLab fellows uh, frequently is um, building an audience regardless of if, if it's a product-based rewards uh, strategy or any of these crowdfunding pieces uh, takes some moments and actually do it with an Excel spreadsheet now. There's just This is where the work comes in. And think about not individuals, but audiences. So for me, I'll just share with you our block that we live on in South Minneapolis is really tight. So that's one tab of the spreadsheet. It's my, my, uh, my block. Um, my kids' friends, uh, we have twins in fifth grade, so they're, they're parents, right? So school parents. Then I would have my high school classmates I'm still in touch with. That's another tab. Then it's people I served in the legislature with. Then it's my law firm. Each of those are your own audiences. And then what it allows you to do is to then fill in those people from your contacts, but it segmenting those audiences and building those lists then you do that early outreach of, hey, I have some really interesting, exciting news, Connie. I'm uh, developing this new scissor that is going to be great in the kitchen and in the craft room. 
Um, and you know, down the road, I'm going to be launching it. Here's some more information. I'd love to see if you'd ever be interested. I don't know exactly how I'm going to raise money or how it's going to, but um, and so you just sort of build that, and that's your audience. That's how you get feedback as you go in product development or company development, and ultimately then. In the end, you say, hey, now's the time, Connie. Are you ready to invest in my, you know, build a better scissor uh, product? And then, um, hey, can you spread the word to five or ten of your friends on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever? It's a lot of work, but that's why it takes time to get it up and running. The, the preparation is very key. Deliberate communication is important. Um, I guess my biggest takeaway, if I could, you know, make one point for all of this, is that, you um, Crowdfunding is powerful because it combines marketing with fundraising, uh, getting that crowd built, using that crowd and getting their insights as well as uh, building a reputation with them is part of what makes it such a powerful tool, makes all that hard work and preparation worth it in the end. Um, I'm going to say thank you for all of you being here. Uh, it's really cool to see all the support. I think kind of is going to close. Yeah, yeah so. great. Uh that is all good information and i will just put in an additional plug for some of the platforms is my understanding will help you workshop some of those marketing issues so take that into mind as you're evaluating um platforms and then we'll see what else we can get going here at innovation lab to help with those kinds of questions so once again thanks everyone we're going to sign off feel free to get the downloadable guide uh, it's on the FinLab website and have a great rest of your Twin City Startup Week. Bye.